Hello. If I could encourage everyone to take a seat from the front back. Thank you. Okay, has everyone got a seat, almost? It's really important you sit in the front so when we have photos it looks like tons of people were here. So come on up. There's some seats over here. No, not you at the back, come forward. Okay, well, while the last few people are finding their seats, uh, show of hands, who here is at their first Incubate Demo Day? Amazing. Me too. <laughs> so I'm five months into the role. My name is Ash Wallington and I'm the director here at Incubate. And it is my huge pleasure to welcome you here this evening. I started a few months ago just in time to help select the group of startups that you're going to see tonight. And I'm really uh, excited to see them present and uh, hear your thoughts about them as well. A couple of housekeeping matters before we kick off. Uh, if anyone's in need of uh, the bathrooms, uh, they're back out through the door that you came through. There's some yellow umbrellas, you turn right and then uh, head back in. And uh, this is also a no smoking area, so if you're desperate for a puff, you might have to leave the venue entirely and then wish that you get back in. Not sure about that. Now, before we kick things off officially, it's my pleasure to invite Bianca Williams to the stage for an acknowledgement of country. woman whose people descend from the far western region of New South Wales. My indigenous heritage as a Barkindji woman connects me with this, one of Australia's most well-known ancient cases proving continued Aboriginal connection to country, that is Mungo Man from the Wallandra Lakes region. I'd like to give a personal acknowledgement. I stand here today fortunate enough to come from a long line of strong Aboriginal women. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge my grandmother, Dr. Evelyn Crawford Senior. 
a former alumni of the University of Sydney, my grandmother had to basically endure a, a status and be classed as flora or fauna and not be able to access formal education. She was basically born under a tree in the middle of a sheep paddock and didn't find out her birthday until many years later, upon returning to the same property, checking the stock register and noting on the 26th of May, 1926, born to the station were two foals, three calves, and a baby girl to Jack and Annie Malia. So interestingly, that's a part of my history that I carry along with many other Indigenous Australians. The landscape, sorry, talking about Nana, I, that's an image of her, and again, I would like to acknowledge the fact that I'm here as a result of this woman. If you can see this little green dot, that's pretty much the property where she was born. And there you can see Brewarrina, Sydney's all the way up here. And it kind of gives you an indication of the landscape um, living and working around. And the blue dot represents the uh, tribal boundaries of my Barkindji people. In talking about innovation, Aboriginal Australians are considered, in my books, one of the first innovators in the world. And in particular, I'd like to refer to this image. This is an image taken in the 1800s of um, an aqua marine fish trap system on the Barwon Darling River Basin. Now, there's a creation story connected to these fish traps, and it's said that Bayami, who's believed to be the creator on the East Coast, saw the people experiencing a great deal of famine and disaster. So him and his sons stepped down from the clouds to Byrock and then to Brewarrina and worked with the local songmen. And an interesting fact about the rocks, um, in particular in this image, they don't come from that part of the river. They've not found, they come from about 100 kilometres away. So it's really interesting that this very complex, detailed rock system of fish traps was able to be built with a series of stone that actually doesn't even come from the area. Now, these have been carbon dated to be older than the pyramids. So, ladies and gentlemen, some 700 kilometres west of Sydney, we have living ancient infrastructure that has been developed and designed through Aboriginal culture, and it's still used to this day. It's just a fish traps, what they're looking like today. I thought that was a really beautiful image to give you a sense of how beautiful nature can be and invoke an emotional reaction. The landscape we meet on today is very different to the one that once stood here. These ancestral lands have always been a place of innovative learning and sharing by the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. For thousands of years, the Gadigal mob nurtured and protected these lands, which in turn provided for their generations. The incorporation of innovation in an Aboriginal context is quite extensive. From our local knowledge, plants, natural materials, through to using stellar constellations to map out geographical journeys or to get an understanding of seasonality and changes in the weather. In a contemporary sense, who here has seen $50 note? Pineapple, hopefully you all have. Brilliant. Have you ever noticed that the man on one side of that note is an Aboriginal man? That man's name is David Unipine, and he's a Nunga from South Australia. And what he's really famous for is inventing the electronic sheep shears. So back in the day, it used to be manual, but he came up with this design to mechanise it, which is why he's acknowledged on our $50 note as one of our leading innovators in terms of Indigenous Australia. I would like to ask you now, I'd like to ask you all, please, just to close your eyes very briefly. I want you to imagine you're on a small canoe on the water. You can hear your family close by as they're reeling in fish. The men can be heard netting and spearing from the shoreline. I want you to imagine the waves transferring energy to you from the motion of the ocean. Now, please place your hand on your hearts. Take that moment to feel that pumping sensation. 
This sensation is the exact same feeling Aboriginal people feel when returning and or reconnecting to their country. You can open your eyes now, ladies and gentlemen. But I want you all to remember that sense, that palpable feeling of energy transferring from your heart to your hand, because that's something that is living and breathing for Aboriginal Australia every day. So what I can do, and what we can all do, is acknowledge the fact that we are standing on Aboriginal land. We can pay our respects to our elders, past, present, and into the future, as well as acknowledging all other custodians of the country and seas of which Australia is made up of. Ladies and gentlemen, as a multicultural society, let us never forget the rich Aboriginal history that the traditional custom, the rich Aboriginal history that still lives and breathes today. And don't be afraid to find out more about the traditional custodians of your particular homes. Thank you and good luck to our 2018 incubators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bianca. Well, that was actually a perfect segue into my introduction, which was to, uh, to first of all tell you that you're going to hear about some really cool things tonight. And we don't want you to keep that to yourself, we want you to share it. So if you use these hashtags, we can ensure that we push that through our network as well, so please get tweeting and so forth. But the question is, why are we at the Maritime Museum today? Sure, we're close to a beautiful CBD location and luckily we're not drenched by rain, which is very fortunate. But actually there's another subtle alignment, uh, one that I'm going to use with a couple of maritime related puns as well. And that actually draw, draws a, con a similar comparison to the point that Bianca made, which is that vessels and ships were amongst some of the first innovations that man came up with to explore a territory outside of their current home. Back in the day, they were setting forth on journeys to find something that had been uncharted. Most of the physical world has been mapped now, so our incubators have gone on a different journey, one of customer value propositions, one of hustling, one of pivoting, and you're going to hear about those journeys here tonight. Now, whether they are sailing solo or they are with a crew on their ship, no matter the size of their team, they have been given amazing navigation from our founder, James Alexander, and I'd like to welcome him to the stage to introduce you to our startups. All right. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for that intro. Uh, it's awesome to be here. Thanks, and it's great to see so many people here to see Class 12. That's them. In fact, they're all around you. Um, and you'll get to meet them afterwards. Um, but tonight, uh, you're going to see a pretty huge, diverse array uh, of startups. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because I want you to see them pitch. So, without further ado, we're going to jump straight into pitching. And I'd like to invite James Bailey from Pocket Graphics on stage. Please make it feel welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm James, oh, well. I'm James, and this is Pocket Graphics. Now, here's the point where I'm supposed to tell you about the pain of my industry, but the problem is I don't really have an industry. We're inventing a whole new category. TVs have gotten bigger over the last few years, but the actual screen size we've been watching has been getting smaller as people turn to tablets, laptops, and phones to watch their content. And the problem is, as the screen size shrinks, so does your emotional engagement with what you're watching. I'm worried it's killing cinema because you can't imagine watching a movie premiere on your phone. There's a big TV in your lounge room, but it's hard to drag it upstairs to watch a movie in bed, so you just watch it on your laptop. And connecting to TVs on the go is a pain. So, the only other alternative is a projector, but they're stuck in the 80s. Projectors are big, bulky boxes, and the smallest of them are still as big as a book and terrible quality. And you're not just carrying that. You, let's say, okay, I want to put a TV on the wall, okay, I've got to find a white wall. Well, now I've got to be exactly two meters away and exactly two meters high, it's just the right angle, or the image looks terrible. So you have to carry a tripod or you're rearranging the furniture, um, and that's before you connect all the cables. Anyone who does this for a living, it's a fun couple of minutes. So we've done away with all of that. 
we've literally made a cinema in your pocket. It can make a four metre TV anywhere you go, or a 30 centimetre one, it doesn't matter. It has no cables, it has no button, it doesn't need a tripod. It, it's so small that it just uses your phone or laptop as the stand. We've given it a sensor so it can sense any wall that it's pointed towards and so it automatically configures itself to always be square and always look, look good. I packed 15 years of forensic technology and image enhancement in this projector, so it's the first projector that will actually get better as time goes on. So how do we do it? Well, other projectors are a bit like a game of shadow puppets. You make a bright light and then you block 95% of that light to make the images and shapes and colours that you see. Um, it's very inefficient, that's why they're so big. We don't do that. We just get three lasers, reflect it off a mirror that moves very fast. It's a bit like me moving a laser pointer faster than your eye can see. And uh, it, it, there's, there's so many advantages to doing it that way. Um, the t high resolution for something that's tiny, um, it's very colourful because lasers are so colourful. And most importantly, when it's off, it's just off, so you don't waste a drop of power. And if you're watching Star Wars, well, space is actually black. Yes, it should be, um, and that's something you wouldn't see in any cinema. Uh, now to the market. Uh, projected have sold pretty well over the past few years, about 8 million units, 6.4 billion US dollars. Uh, flat, but small projectors in that time have gone from 1 20th of the market to 1 3rd. They're exploding, and nobody's made a good one yet. Um, none have made, uh, are as small as ours. And we've got uh, 200 subscribers, half of whom have, uh, want to buy pocket graphics who have never thought to buy a projector, so we think we can expand the market. Um, we've got people who are, uh, we've, we've done extensive user testing, we've got, uh, we have, like, we've really made this thing. Uh, people don't want to give the units back, which I took as a good sign. We've got couples watching movies on the roof as they go to sleep, we've got people bringing the campsite together and the family together with a Harry Potter marathon, we've got Nintendo on the wall. Um, so we're very excited to see what people will do with this. And we've got one more trick up our sleeve. TVs outsell projectors 50 to 1. Why? Well, for a TV, you don't have to turn out the lights, where a cinema has to be pretty dark. But we thought, what if it doesn't? So we've designed a screen that is able to greatly increase the brightness and contrast of a projector in any lighting condition. It's pretty hard to describe, uh, but if you want to see it, you can come to the demo booth afterwards. But it won't happen if we don't get support. So we're gonna have a Kickstarter in about a month and we need to make a bunch of these. Um, so if you were excited um, to change the world of cinema, please go to this website and subscribe. If you're in this room, you'll be the first to get it when we ship in April. Um, if the, the more we sell, the cheaper they'll be, the better quality the first ones will be and James still needs his Sydney house. Um, we're also looking for investment uh, for marketing and product and IP. We've got, um, I've got a great team. We've got, uh, we're working with design and industry, who are Australia's best designers, in my opinion. Um, and we uh, have got, uh, there's only two manufacturers in the world that make the parts that make pocket graphics work. And we've got a good relationship with both of them. So who are we? Well, as me, my only claim to fame is I was the first person to use neural networks to enhance an image for the Supreme Court. It's like a boring version of CSI. Um, and then there's my dad, who's a forensics entrepreneur and a biomedical engineer. And there's Bella, who wrote a lar large part of Grand Theft Auto V um, and also designed his own virtual reality helmets. Um, also, I'd like to thank James Alexander and Mike Nichols and Liz Kalin and Brad Deverson and all the other mentors. We definitely wouldn't be here without them. Thank you very much for your time. How cool is that? That was fantastic. Um, afterwards, there's gonna be demos, actual product demos, so you can get over there and check out the projector. It's really small and very, very, very high definition. It's fantastic. Next up, I'd like to welcome Francisca from Petite B. co-founder of Petite Beat, where we are creating a bonding device for pregnant women. 
Did you know that more than 40% of women struggle to connect emotionally with their baby during pregnancy? Studies show that this can lead to anxiety and stress after perinatal depression. And this is not only a problem for women. One in 10 fathers is suffering from perinatal depression as well. We talked to over 800 pregnant women, and this is what one of them said to us. Between me and you, I don't feel any emotional connection to my baby, and I'm afraid I won't love it. Nobody should have to feel this way, and this is why we are developing Petite Beat. Petite Beat is an uninvasive bonding device consisting of a fetal heart rate monitor and a pillow which amplifies the baby's heartbeat through light, sound, and vibration. The uniqueness of our tangible approach goes back to that desire for women to simply enjoy their pregnancy as a natural experience rather than a medical one. And to give something back to the baby in return, after birth, mothers and fathers can integrate their own heartbeat into the pillow to help the baby sleep at night. Why do we think that works? Studies have shown that there is a strong correlation between fetal attachment and the moment where the mother starts feeling her baby. And we think that we, Petite Beat is going to accelerate and strengthen this process for everyone. There are 300,000 births in Australia every year, and those parents are willing to spend a lot of money on their pregnancy. A $200 retail value would generate $60 million in revenue per year. Mothers from all over the world subscribe to buy Petite Beat, and this is why in future we want to expand globally. You might be wondering how our competition is tackling this problem at the moment. <coughs> Currently, there's only one established method on the global market to experience the baby's heartbeat, which is the fetal Doppler. This method is used at doctor's appointment, and there's also a lot of take-home options available. And while this might sound promising, it has a lot of downsides. Um, the technical interface often causes anxiety as opposed to clarity, and its active ultrasound waves actually harm the baby's and the mother's health. Petite Beat uses passive sound sensors to detect the baby's heartbeat and is therefore 100% safe to use for every day and gives the parents a feeling of reassurance and helps them to share their pregnancy experience with their loved ones. We already know that mothers want our product. Within the last month, over 300 mothers signed up to our waiting list and are ready to buy Petite Beat. This is the team behind Petite Beat. I'm a biomedical engineer with focus on interaction design. Anna is a marketing specialist, and Jess is focusing on engineering and business. We are at the moment supported by those four great ladies who are all excelling in the field of expertise or are successful entrepreneurs themselves. <coughs> so where are we now at the moment? We are happy to announce that we are taking on pre-orders starting from today. Um, <laughs> We are hoping to get our product ready to pilot test and launch our Kickstarter in March 2019. After our product launch in June, we are hoping to exceed the number of 5,000 customers by October 2019. And in order to achieve all of this, we are at the moment trying to raise $200,000. So if you're happy uh, or interested in investing in us, please come and have a chat to us later. Also, if you know anyone who's trying to plan a family or who might be interested in our product, Please spread the word about Petit Beat and help us to improve pregnancy experiences all over the world. Thank you. Thanks, Francisca. Uh, one of the coolest things uh, with having Petit Beat in the office is actually they've got sewing machines in the office. So we've got like all these monitors and people coding and now sewing machines for all the prototypes. It's really cool. Okay, next up is Lewis from BioScout. I'm Lewis, CEO and co-founder of Bioscout, and I'm here to introduce to you our revolutionary airborne disease monitoring and tracking platform. Airborne disease has always presented a problem to Australian agriculture, but as Australia and the world have grown closer together, so has the ability for diseases to spread. We're now seeing faster and more severe outbreaks, which means today our farmers are losing 20% or $2.6 billion of their yield to disease every day. And considering we're the world's leading agricultural producers, this is a very worrying figure. 
But why does disease cost so much to the Australian farmer? Well, as we all know, Australia is a very large country, and 53% of that land is dedicated to agriculture. That's three and a half million square kilometres. But we only monitor a tiny fraction of that land for disease, which allows them to spread and fester. And we are still using the same technology to detect disease as we did 50 years ago, and it's costing our farmers billions. And that's why we've developed the patented BioScout platform. <laughs> A mobile, cheap, and fast airborne disease tracking system and analytics platform. Our solution consists of three components. An air sampling device that is specially designed to capture and separate pathogens from the air. These separated pathogens are then identified and detected by our automated analysis device. And finally, we present this information onto our high-resolution disease map and dashboard. These maps detail the presence of disease, their severity and potential threat vectors, and will allow farmers and agronomists to quickly determine the presence of the disease and provide the best means of protecting their crops. In fact, scientific studies have shown that if farmers use our technology, they will have to be able to save up to 50% of their yield compared to using traditional disease control methods. Our business model is a subscription-based service. When a farmer signs up, we put our devices into their fields, giving them incredibly fast and detailed information about any disease outbreaks in their crops, allowing them to tackle disease outbreaks before they become a problem. But that's not all. Using the data that we collect from across Australia, we allow farmers to see disease outbreaks in their local region and give them the time to protect their crops much earlier than they would otherwise. We're giving them real-time disease information straight into their inbox. And that's the best thing about our product. As we grow, so does the value of our offering. As we continue to build out our network of sensors across Australia, we're also building the world's largest airborne disease detection system. So what's our market opportunity? Well, it's massive. Our, our target market is the top 20% of broadacre farmers by land area, and they're worth $225 million, while the total horticultural and broadacre farms are worth nearly half a billion, and that's just Australia. Globally, our opportunities are even bigger, with many overseas countries having far greater disease losses than Australia. Our team brings together a large range of experiences from many different fields, from industrial control systems to financial AI. No one can bring the same dedication and passion we have to solving this problem. And for the last 10 months, we've been working tirelessly to change the way the world monitors airborne diseases, during which we've conducted a dozen farm trials, organized government support, and generated our first revenue. We're now in talks with the Federal Department of Agriculture and the New South Wales Government to bring our systems to the next level. And that's why we're opening a seed round at $750,000, all of which will be dedicated to putting as many of our devices across as many farms as we can. That means over 18 months, putting 150 of our devices into 50 different farms while conducting 100 drone-based disease surveys. So, if you're interested in revolutionising airborne disease monitoring and want to put useful data into the hands of farmers, please come talk to me after. Thank you. Awesome. Stuff, Lewis. Um, and on to the next one. Please welcome Daniel from Brilla. is a new platform that helps people find professional development for the modern day workplace. In the past, professional development was provided by your company. They would give you skills and training and a pathway, but it tended to be focused on their needs, not yours. You had a permanent position in a structured workplace, training and career development that isn't available in the modern workforce. 
Today, we have a work workforce or workplace that has increased casualization and short-term contracts. Take Sally. Sally is a modern IT professional. She works for a number of different companies, sometimes with short-term contracts as little as three months. None of these companies provide her with any sort of career training or development plan that they're interested in Sally's goals. It's up to Sally to do this herself. Brillup provides personalized, professional development that you can access anytime at any workplace, allowing the modern worker in a casualized workforce to focus on their own professional development even when their company does not. It does this by uh, identifying and assessing your current skills and expertise. It helps you set your career goals for your own personal growth. And it identifies a strategic plan that helps fill in your skill gap, helping you level up those skills and level up your career. The modern professional needs to be flexible. So the Brillo platform is flexible to suit. Some professionals may only require an update to their skill assessment and training. Others will be interested in our standalone workshops. Others still might find value in a membership subscription that allows access to both assessment planning workshops and access to the Brillup online community, which provides ongoing support as your career develops. Previously, the options were one of three. You either allowed your company to set your career goals and plan for their needs. You paid a professional career coach, sometimes up to $300, $400 per hour. Or, if you're like most workers, you left it up to luck. Brillup provides a personalized, accessible platform that gives you the ability to update your skills once they're identified, leveling up those skills and your future. At the moment in Australia, the growing training market is about $9 billion. Worldwide, about 360. Brillup is positioned to capture some of this market share with a new way for the modern worker to have their career development plans that move with them. Some of our existing Brillup customers have already found value with this service. We've helped them identify skill gaps and help them find a strategic plan that works for them and helps them find their goals. Brillup has a vision. We'd like to see everyone of the modern day workers be able to take a plan that they've developed with them from workplace to workplace, no matter where that is in the world. To achieve this, Brillup has put together a brilliant team. Kathy has over 10 years of education experience and she's hired the most appropriate developers, IT professionals and marketers to help her provide the Brillup platform for the modern worker. But we'd like you to join us. We're looking for beta testers for our new products. We're also looking for companies who might be interested in providing the Brillup platform to their staff that is casualized or perhaps on short-term contracts where they cannot provide a in-house career development plan. And anyone else who's interested in the uh, training space is welcome to come and join us over at the Birth. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Daniel. Um, now, I believe we're pretty much nearly at capacity, so well done and everyone for coming on this cloudy day. 
Um, but there are a few seats at the front area and just on the side here. So for those at the back, if they'd like to grab a seat, there are a few little seats in between. So please do come down. Otherwise, please have a warm welcome for our next speaker, Jingle from Backpock. Hi everyone, I'm Jingle from Backpock. And we're tackling an issue I'm sure many of you might find familiar, and that is lost and found. So, who here has lost something outside recently? Let me ask, what was it like looking for it? I'm sure it was very fun, right? And for some of you, it may have went along the lines of this. You picked up your phone, and you started to call up every place you've been to that day. Sometimes, like, sometimes they don't even pick up, and you spend half that time being placed on hold. And when they do pick up, you get placed on hold again while they try to transfer you to the right person. You get the point. This is what they see. Most organizations are still using pen and paper or Excel to manage their lost and found. But when you have lost and found information on Excel spreadsheets and sticky notes scattered everywhere in a place as big as a university, you can easily see why it takes them so long to search through it and why some information might just slip through the cracks. For a typical high traffic organization, our research has found that on average, 1.3 hours of labor is spent for every found item, 3,000 items are found every year, and only 20 to 30% of these items are actually returned. This is why we built Backpock, a centralized platform for lost and found that will help businesses better manage the lost and found. A platform accessible by staff anytime, anywhere, and keeps owners out of the dark about their inquiries. By streamlining the process of searching, matching, and returning items, we cut down on the time spent on lost and found to a tenth of what it normally is. We also allow different businesses to share registries with each other. So, for example, if you were a major retail store within Westfield, like Maya, you'd be able to share your registry with Westfield. So if, if anyone visits their concierge desk, staff there will not only be able to check their own registry, but Maya as well. With Backpock, the lost and found process will be much shorter for both sides. More owners will be reunited with the items sooner, and everyone will just have a much better lost and found experience. We are currently targeting universities, shopping centers, airlines and airports. We believe that in Australia, 93.7 million is being spent every year managing lost and found. Eventually, we do wish to expand to other countries like the US, Canada, and New Zealand. So, how do we make money? We currently charge $3,000 a year for every location using our platform. And in terms of traction, we have one organization that has signed up, and four that are currently trialing. We are also in talks with some of the biggest organizations in Australia, with over 90K in discussion. This is what UTS thinks of our platform. Easy to use, fast, accurate, and a massive leap forward from our previous lost property reporting system. The vision at Backpock is to make the process of lost and found frictionless for both sides, for those who lose their item and those who find it. And this is the team that will make that happen. Ben, my brilliant co-founder, who single-handedly built the platform you see today. That's me. Uh, I handle the customer side of things. And Liz has been a fantastic mentor and a lighthouse for us throughout our journey. We'd love to get in touch with someone from Virgin Australia or the Queensland Investment Corporation. Specifically, someone managing innovation or customer experience. If you know someone there, find us afterwards. Now, before I end this pitch, I just wanted to leave you with this. If you don't know something, Google it. If you can't find something, back pocket. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jingle. OK, we are halfway through. Please welcome, next on the stage, Gabrielle from Ardle.
<laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Gabrielle and I'm the CEO and founder of Ardle. Uh, we're making property more affordable and more accessible with our interest-free home loan platform. Housing affordability in Sydney is beyond crisis point. If you started saving for your home today, it would take you on average nine years to get your deposit, which is triple the amount of time that baby boomers had to save back in the 70s. Every year for the past 11 years, we have been with a deficit of housing. We're just not building enough. And the amount that we're short is increasing at a rate of 40,000 homes per year. We will need to build more than 4 million properties on top of what we're already building in order to have enough supply to decrease housing prices by 2025. This is our platform. So we're a like-minded community of 1,000 home buyers. Every person saves an affordable amount for them. We're looking at an average of about $150 per week into an aggregate fund. This fund then generates, through the money deposited, interest-free home loans loaned back to members so that they can afford to purchase their home. For the structure of the fund, I've chosen something that is tried and tested here in Australia already. We're using a unit-based trust. Now, every time you deposit money, every dollar you deposit purchases a unit in the trust. Every unit has a tracking number. It's traceable through the system. At tax time, it's accounted for uh, to the ATO and it's regulated by ASIC. It's the same system currently being used uh, by Islamic finance providers here in Australia and they manage $500 million worth of interest-free home loans. This isn't a unique or new business model. It's quite an ancient one. Uh, this is just the first time that it's being offered outside of a religious community. This is me. Look, I'm wearing the same stuff. You can tell. Oh my God. I'm the founder and CEO, obviously, um, and I have a finance and analytics background here at the University of Sydney. Well, not here, but campus. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the Shire of Borkham Hills, which is an award that's given um, for outstanding citizens, a little bit like Australian of the Year, uh, and that was for my anti-bullying program. Now, we are open for investment, just casually, but what I'm really passionate about uh, is helping people afford their home and to get into their first home. So if you're here in the audience and you haven't started saving or you are saving or you're really bad at saving, uh, please come and have a chat to me. Uh, I would love to have a look at your journey, have a look at your budget uh, and try and get you into a home a bit faster to let you know how good I am at budgeting uh, one of the people that went through our finance and budget knowledge workshop found $3,000 that he didn't know that he had. <laughs> it's probably my biggest success so far. Um, but I would love to help you with your situation. Thank you. Thanks, Gabrielle. Okay, and next up is Hamid from Easy Wheel. Hello everyone, I'm Hamid Torfanjad, the founder of EasyWheel. I'm going to show you a new device that can be attached to a manual wheelchair and turn into a kind of motorized wheelchair. Manual and, motor, uh, and electric wheelchair have some advantages and disadvantages. For example, manual wheelchairs are low price, around $500. There are low weights, around 50 kg, 15 kg. Uh, there are foldable and uh, more, uh, portable, uh, but they are not convenient for uh, long distance usage. In comparison, uh, electric wheelchairs are expensive, between 3,000 to 10,000. Uh, they are heavy, around 50 kilograms. Uh, they are not foldable and portable easily, 
but they are uh, uh, comfortable for long distance usage. Now I introduce EasyWheel, a hybrid solution between electric and uh, manual wheelchair. This is a new device that can be connected uh, to a manual wheelchair and convert it to, a, uh, to an electric wheelchair. Uh, so the new wheelchair would be low price, low weight, portable, and uh, convenient for long distance usage. As you can see in this uh, video, uh, it's easy to connect the device to uh, the wheelchair. And uh, this device consists of a 12 inch uh, hub motor, a lithium rechargeable battery that can work for three hours or 30 kilometers uh, continuous, and it can go forward and backward. There are some competitors around the world, from USA and uh, uh, Europe, but still some of them are uh, heavy, more than 30 kilograms. Some of them are uh, not foldable and portable, and totally the price is high, between $4,000 to $9,000. Uh, in comparison, EasyWheel is uh, less than $2,000, uh, 15 kilograms, it is foldable and uh, uh, easy to connect to the wheelchair. And uh, the most important, it, is, uh, it has uh, on-site services around, uh, in Australia that none of the competitors have this uh, feature. The market opportunity is the number of people who use the kind of wheelchair in uh, Australia. There are 200,000 people in Australia, 1.2 million in UK, 3 million in USA, and more than 7 million around the world, and the number is growing every day. Uh, this is an example model of uh, this device that uh, we are working with the manufacturer to uh, modify and customize this device to pass the safety issues. Uh, the retail price is $1,900. Uh, it is a reasonable price for everybody who uses a kind of uh, manual wheelchair to buy this device instead of uh, uh, buying uh, an electric device. And the margin is uh, 60%. I am the founder of EasyWheel, a PhD student in electronics, uh, with 15 years ex experience in intelligent transportation systems. Uh, Tim and Aaron uh, have uh, more than 20 years uh, experience in uh, sales, marketing, uh, import, and export. Uh, my advisor is James. I appreciate, really appreciate him for his advice. And also I should uh, appreciate Ash, uh, Lizette, and uh, Serena, for, uh, and also the other mentors in, in Kuwait for their uh, care and support. Uh, today I'm looking for uh, introduction to distributors inside and outside Australia, and uh, governmental channel connections like Parkwood, NDIS, uh, SCIA, and any, uh, all of the other communities that uh, work with disabled people. Uh, thank you for listening. Please contact me if you are interested in this. Thanks, Amid. I always like to remind everyone that pitching on stage is pretty um, um, daunting anyway, let alone doing it in your second language. And we've got a few founders doing that tonight, so it's fantastic to see them on stage pitching so confidently. Okay, on to the next startup. Please welcome Puya from Visospace. Hello, everyone. I'm Puya from Visospace, CEO and co founder of Visospace. And we are bringing to the world the full potential of virtual reality. And I'm really excited to be here with you. So we're at, the new, at a new era of, of uh, computing, spatial computing. What does that even mean? In spatial computing, your desktop is the space around you. And the cursor, that's you, it's your body. We already know this kind of technology. And today, we call it augmented reality and virtual reality. But as compelling and as exciting as these mediums are, they've got their limitations now. Some people get motion sickness in VR. 
the interaction with the current controllers are clunky with buttons and things. And there's a lack of sensory feedback. But the future is bright. The future will see the development of, of interface technology to include slimmer headsets that are more like glasses, haptic hand devices that will let you feel and touch virtual objects as if they're there, and platforms underneath you that will let you move around the, the, the world freely and untethered. And that's what we're working on in VisoSpace. We want to make the virtual feel real. So today, I present to you our first product, the Alto, your very own personal hoverboard. Have you ever had a hoverboard before? Here it is. The Alto is a, is a small, uh, slim device. It's, it's affordable, and it can be used for many applications using virtual reality. Anything from architectural visualization to virtual travel and, of course, entertainment. To use it, you stand on it, you lean or, or push yourself in the direction that you want to go, and you fly. It's really cool. I encourage you to come and try it. So we're taking this to market now. And the market, the VR market, is already sizable and growing every day. The businesses that we are addressing right now are referred to as location-based entertainment, or you might know them as VR arcades. And these, these businesses are already making money. But their problem is throughput, and that is how many people you can get in and out of arcades at, at, at a certain time. And the Alto can help with that. So in, its, in a turnkey solution for arcades, we can pack more people into arcades for multiplayer entertainment and experiences. Um, we will charge the arcades a setup fee and an ongoing recurring revenue for support and added content. So who else is doing this? There's already a number of devices in the market um, for locomotion in VR. But these are either small and cheap and tailored to the home, or they've been made for arcades and they're big and bulky and expensive, and they're really hard to get in and out of, like this one here. The Alto is special in that it can service both areas. No wonder why it's been called a game changer by one of the leaders in the location-based uh, location entertainment industry, Bob Cooney. For us to be able to pull this off, we need a great team, and we do. We are an award-winning team of technical creatives who have deep experience in product design that includes software and hardware and, and uh, marketing. And on our advisory board, we have Ted Chilowitz, futurist at Paramount Pictures, who is a regular keynote speaker at major VR events around the world. So we're in good hands. We've been around for 18 months, and in this time, we've had hundreds of user tests with our prototypes. We've uh, filed for a provisional patent. We've sold to our first customers in business and, and, and consumers. And we're piloting with three arcades, our solution. We're well on our way of achieving our grand vision, which starts with the Alto as a, as a peripheral product for locomotion, but continues on to we are creating a hand interface that we've developed the IP for that will allow you to feel and touch virtual objects. A product like this will have major uh, ramifications in many industries, including medicine and rehabilitation, engineering and design, as well as robotics. When we do this, we will truly be hailing a new era in human-computer interaction. But to achieve it, we need support. We are raising a million dollars for the next 18 months to hit our targets, to grow our team, to grow our market traction, and to build our first hand device as a proof of concept that will be used as a backbone for our next round. I'm really excited that I've shared this with you. I encourage you to come over and talk to us and have a, have a try of our, our device. Thank you for listening. I'm VisoSpace. I'm Kuya from VisoSpace. Thanks, Buya. It's fantastic. Really recommend you go have a try. Uh, it's, it's unreal to like float around the world. It's, it's, and they've got a cool game as well. OK, next up is Ming from Mirth. Hello, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Ming, founder of Murph. We are building the next generation of electric transport. And this is why I started. Public transport is always frustrated. It's always crowded. And I had to stick with their timetable, meaning I can't go anywhere, anytime I want. Not to mention this guy. Opel car is expensive. And it is getting more and more expensive. Another nightmare, congestion. And increasing petrol and expensive parking tickets. And this, is, and this makes me think, is there a tool that can bring me to anywhere, anytime that I want? without stucking in congestion, without paying expensive parking, expensive petrol. And this is what we have been working for. A Murph electric bike, ah, oh, sorry, a Murph electric scooter. <laughs> we have integrated a full-size battery in the front vertical pole, and we have to redesign the structure to fit in the motor inside the front wheel. And just to press the photo, it goes. You don't need to kick for it, you don't need to hassle. And just the click of the button, it falls, meaning you can fit it into your trunk, into anywhere you want. And it also has an energy recovery system, meaning when you press the brake, it absorbs the kinetic energy back to its battery. And that's another secret of its very long cruising distance, which is up to 30 kilometers. And this is the perfect solution for mid-range travel. What about a longer range? A Murph electric bicycle. And one of the biggest challenges riding a bicycle in Australia is its hilly terrain. Climbing hills can be very exhausting and frustrating. With our Murph e-bike, it can give you a push anytime you want. And what makes it special? It has a force sensor integrated in the pedal. You're right, it's intelligent. AI in a bicycle. It interacts with the user. Whenever you need to talk, it, understand, it understands it. And if you give you more talk accordingly, and it also has the world's smallest e-bike battery, meaning you can just take the battery off, put it in your pocket, charge it in your office or your home, and then you can leave your bicycle behind. And this is what we have done so far. We have 11 sales in April, and we have reached 121 sales in October. That's around 1,000% growth. And this is what we have done. We have 341 sales, approximately 200K revenue so far. <laughs> and now we're raising 500K from marketing, product development, team expansion, and set up our first Murph kiosk, which is like a physical store. By the end of this year, we'll finish our, ex we'll finish our team expansion, and our new product will launch in March. And after that, we'll sell globally. And by the way, we have sold 100 items to Singapore this month. And we will set up our first Murph kiosk in Sydney. And after that, we'll, by the end of next year, we will reach 500 sales uh, per month, which is, according, uh, which is 30K revenue per month. And this is our team. We have three engineers and three sales in our team so far. And we are expanding. If you are marketing talent, or if you are a hardware engineer, or if you have retail networking, or if you think simply you can bring us more sales, please contact us. And also, the retail price for a scooter is $719. Because you're special, we are giving a special promo code, Merc12, for you tonight. If you're interested, check on our website. And I'll see you in the booth. Thank you. Thanks, Ming. Um, it's a fantastic bike and fantastic e-scooter, so go try it out and grab one tonight if you can. Um, next up is Aaron from ShopCroc. Hi, I'm Aaron Cowper. I'm the founder and CEO of ShopCroc. We are a platform for retailers uh, to make better pricing decisions uh, around category management and, and price optimization. So price perception is, is the number one driver of performance in retail, uh, and, and it's very difficult to achieve uh, price perception, as in customers perceiving that your prices are, are, are competitive, as well as maintaining your, your, your profit margin. 
Um, and, and most retailers currently are leaving this up to gut feel um, because it's very difficult to actually get a good sense of where you are in terms of your pricing. It's very difficult to, to collect uh, data. Typically, people are sending uh, uh, humans into stores to collect pricing. Um, data matching is very tedious uh, to determine which prices match uh, from, one com from one retailer to another. Uh, and surfacing insights from the data is very difficult. Uh, I, I know this because I was uh, head of price strategy and price analytics at Woolworths supermarkets and we were in a crisis period in, in 2015. We were trying to work out uh, what to do to improve our, our sales performance and our, and our price perception. And we were sending people into stores. We were spending a million dollars a year to send people into stores to do this. And fast forward two years and consumers are becoming even more price conscious. Uh, they're demanding ultra convenience. They're willing to shop around and of course Amazon has now arrived. And so retailers are really scrambling to understand where they are in terms of their Amazon strategy, let alone their, their, their strategy against the brick and mortar competitors. So here, here's where uh, ShopRock Insights comes in. It's a true practitioner's pra platform, an insider's view of pricing, and it's a new level of insight in terms of price management and category optimization. It tracks millions of price points from geolocations all around the globe uh, and gathers them uh, from weekly down to multiple daily uh, and, and ensures there's never a gap in market visibility. It provides seamless over overlay of dozens of retailers' data uh, and we have uh, proprietary matching algorithms that, that match the data from multiple retailers to ensure this occurs. Uh, and the real secret source is in actually surfacing the right insights at the right time. A typical retailer range is something like 50,000 products uh, and which of those products should you invest in, in lower prices in order to, to make sure you improve your price perception. So we've built a world-class team uh, of advisors and, and uh, subject matter experts in pricing and in data analytics. Uh, so I myself uh, was head of price strategy and price analytics at Woolworths and I've previously spent uh, 10 years in consulting two, consum two consumer brands uh, and retailers around uh, Asia, Australia and the US. Uh, and we have uh, a growing team of, of, of experts in the field. So why now? Retail analytics is a huge market. Globally, just in pricing and, and category managing analytics, it's a billion dollar market already. It's growing at a, at a CAGA of 20%. Uh, and as I said, we are true subject matter experts in this field. Uh, in particular in Australia, this is becoming a huge challenge for retailers. So retailers are really scrambling. Just today, uh, Amazon had launched their, their pantry offering. Uh, and retailers are, are really struggling to understand what they're going to do to, to combat the Amazon threat. Our traction to date, uh, we're, we've only been in operation less than 12 months uh, and by the end of the year we'll have booked $300,000 in uh, booked revenue. Uh, we've already got uh, two ASX listed retailers subscribing to our product uh, and a top five global retailer uh, who's expanding to Australia who's also subscribing. Our typical uh, pricing model is, is a, a, a software as a service uh, type model. Uh, our ACB is about 50k per, per customer per year uh, and we've also got trials on the way with several brands and other retailers. Uh, so we're, we're proving out the use case uh, not only in retail but also in, uh, in consumer goods manufacturing. So what's next? Uh, we're looking to, to partner with uh, any of the brands that you might see on the screen or other retailers uh, and consumer goods manufacturers that you might have connections to. Uh, we're looking at uh, talking to anyone who's uh, a category manager, a, a director of commercial, uh, a director of analytics in any of these uh, types of uh, retailers or brands. So if you, if you are one of these people or you have connections into any of these brands, we, we'd love to have a chat. Uh, we, our milestones for the next 12 months, we, we plan to open around sometime next year uh, and, and in the meantime we're going to be scaling our product uh, and, and getting ready to, to build out uh, an aggressive uh, scaling strategy next year. Uh, so thanks very much and, and please come and ha have a chat to us at the booth uh, and try out the product. Thank you. Thanks Aaron. Um, one of the coolest things having uh, founders like Aaron in the space uh, with proprietary data is you get to actually see what no one else can see and it's, it's actually pretty incredible uh, how much people are missing when you don't have access to, to some of these um, innovations. Okay, lucky last um, is Green Atlas. Please welcome Steve, co-founder of Green Atlas. Hi. I'm Steve Shedding, co-founder of Green Atlas. 
Our vision is to manage the life cycle of every fruit tree on the planet. So, what we're aiming for, and what we help growers do, is try to turn every tree into what we call the Goldilocks tree. And what that means is that that tree has exactly the right amount of fruit to maximise the earning potential per hectare. So we want to maximise the number of dollars. And that covers the entire life cycle of the fruit, from the time it's a flower all the way through to harvest. Growers also want to understand exactly how many pieces of fruit am I going to pick. That helps prime the entire supply chain. That means labour hire, means how many boxes do I need, uh, freight and logistics, all the way through to stock market reporting. It even helps Coles and Woolies understand how many pieces of fruit are going to turn up on my shelves and when are they going to turn up. Now, it's probably fairly easy to, have, to understand how I might manage a single tree, but when you scale it up to the size of a full orchard, you begin to get a sense of the enormity of the problem. One of our larger customers has about four and a half million trees under management, all of which we want to be that Goldilocks tree. Now, currently, in order to manage that crop, Growers are typically only going out and getting a very, very small amount of data, and almost all of that data is captured by hand. In fact, this is our primary competitor in this space. So this is how we do it. So we're introducing the Green Atlas Orchard Cartographer. Not only is this the most advanced orchard scanning platform on the planet, it's also the fastest. <laughs> so in the time that uh, a person has managed to count all the flowers or all the fruit on a single tree, we've counted the flowers or the fruit on 6,000 trees with this platform. <laughs> so this is how we do it. Initially, we go in with our data gathering platform and we scan every single tree, every single flower, every single fruit. Then we turn all of that data into actionable decision support. And finally, we automate the process of managing and optimising that crop so that it achieves its maximum potential. In this case, we're looking at a spraying system that's spraying something like a chemical flower thinning agent. When we finish this process, we've optimised every tree in the orchard, now every tree is that Goldilocks tree. So in order to help us along this journey and achieve this vision, we've already amassed the world's largest data set in apple orchards. Um, we amassed this data in a single two-week intensive, two-week period, uh, in southern New South Wales and Victoria. This is what it looks like when we put it all together. Last week, uh, a grower has asked us to come in and understand their, f uh, their flower distribution over an entire orchard. And what that allows them to do is actually put together a management plan so that they can optimise the potential of this orchard over the coming growing season. In this image, uh, you can see our current data delivery and analysis platform. Um, and in the, in the image, we're actually able to show this particular grower the difference in potential from plants that were actually purchased from two different nurseries. And the difference is really clear. And that's allowed the grower to do two things. One is to manage the zones differently. It would have all been managed as a single block prior to this. It also tells them which nursery to buy their, buy their trees from in the future. Um, shortcut, top right hand corner, these are the good ones. Lots of flowers, lots of fruit. Um, in terms of traction, uh, we've managed to capture uh, a small number but of large customers. Combined, these customers represent greater than 10% of the entire Apple industry in Australia. Um, in addition to the statistics you can see on the screen, we're also experiencing, I guess, one very excited industry. The pull for the kind of technology that we're doing, because it's core to the value stream of our customers, has been absolutely overwhelming. Um, and in fact, we've only been asked to do more and more and more. 
The addressable market is large and growing. If we expand from the apples that we're doing now to our top 10 most commercially valuable uh, fruits, maybe apples, almonds, mangoes, fruits like this, the, we get an order of magnitude increase in the addressable market. If you factor in Europe, there's another order of magnitude increase, and expanding the US and China, there's another order of magnitude again. So, why are James Underwood and I ideally poised to realise the, the Green Atlas vision? Well, James is the world expert in, acknowledged world expert, in the use of machine vision techniques applied to tree crops. This is something he's been doing for six plus years. I've managed a lot of large product development programs in autonomous systems uh, for many large companies, um, including a fairly long stint with one of the world's largest mining companies. How do we make money? So we're fundamentally a services company. Um, what the customers pay is a fee per hectare for our data gathering, data analysis and delivery, and ultimately for a fully automated service helping them optimise their, their crops. The ask is for 1.6 million to help us achieve our next order of magnitude ramp up. So principally, that'll allow us to really establish ourselves in the Apple industry in Australia, um, ramp up the engineering, software developments, marketing and sales, um, and ramp, in, ramp up into an additional four crop types. So, Green Atlas, we're going to manage the life cycle of every fruit tree on the planet. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to talk more at our booth at the back. In fact, first 20 or 30 people we keep missing apples might get an apple. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks to Steve and Green Atlas, I can never look at an apple in a supermarket the same way. I always pick it up I'm like, my God, it's so complicated, and, and yet so manual still. Um, that's it for class 12. Let's give another round of applause for all the founders. Um, uh, I'm only going to be on stage for a few more seconds, um, and we always get this question, so I thought I'd just address it. Um, what are our alumni doing? So this is just some highlights from some of the alumni. Um, the, the lovely looking chap there is, is Francisco, the founder of Sonda. Uh, Sonda won Touch Crunch. Touch Crunch Disrupt in San Francisco earlier this month and is now working with um, some of the largest consumer tech companies in bringing their e-ink keyboard, which you can see sort of just down there, um, to reality. Tribe Fire from our previous cohort got seed investment and landed in the Collider Accelerator up in Queensland. Um, two of our previous startups in defense, AMSL Aero making flying taxis, super cool. Um, Emission Systems, making the world's smallest radar, are now collaborating and have won a significant defense contract, which is pretty cool. Um, and one of our founders' uh, startups, previously Biokite, um, now called Carapac, is in the Grow Lab Accelerator at Cicada here in Sydney, um, having just left the program, which is great. And finally, Abyss, our oldest one in there um, from Class 6, have launched their Houston, Texas office and are growing rapidly. And on top of that, we've got some funding announcements coming, uh, which I can't talk about just yet. But if you come to the next demo day, you'll hear all about it. Um, that's it from me. I'd like to hand it back over to, oh no, one more thing. If you're a founder in the audience and you would like to get our help and our mentor network, you should apply. We're going to be funding uh, up to 15 startups in the next uh, cohort, which kicks off beginning of next year, but we'll be choosing that in the next couple of months. Applications close November 5th. You've got noth nothing to lose. Apply, jump on there, and, uh, and we can't wait to see you. Okay. Thanks very much. That's it from me. Over to Ash. Uh, OK, so I understand that I'm what's standing between you and drinks, so I'm going to make it quick. But it's really important that I say thank you to a few people, because some of those people have provided the drinks for tonight. Uh, so first of all, uh, a big thank you to the University of Sydney Union, uh, who are the home of Incubate. Our vision is to be the best campus experience for students in Australia, and we believe that we achieve that vision by creating the ecosystem for really significant startup opportunities across the campus and faculties, which I'm sure you'll all agree with after seeing these startups tonight. Uh, also, uh, special thanks to our board who are here tonight, so thank you very much. 
uh, and of course the University of Sydney who are our partners. Uh, it wouldn't be possible for us to have the event here tonight without the generosity of the National Maritime Museum and uh, also we'll be enjoying some wines from McWilliams later on and, uh, and we have a range of other industry partners who have been instrumental in helping our startups build their businesses over the past 14 weeks. So thank you very much. It's really, really important uh, for us to have a strong network of mentors because we can't do it on our own. Uh, Liz Kalin, our resident entrepreneur, has been invaluable to our startups. Uh, also, Brad Deverson, Natasha Rawlings, Mike Nichols, amongst many mentors who have been part of advisory boards, mentor mixes, launches, coming in for events. We are so grateful for the continued generosity of their time and knowledge. So thank you so much. I'm sure many of you noticed our fantastic volunteers on the way in today. They have spent uh, a lot of hours helping us, so thank you very much. We love volleys. And also managed ably by uh, Serena, our student leader in the corner there. Thank you so much, Serena. You've kept us afloat. And Lockie, who couldn't be here with us tonight. Now, we wouldn't have seats to sit on, drinks soon to sip on, uh, an event to attend, and our startups would have died of starvation if it wasn't for our superstar, Lizette Lee. Thank you so much, Lizette. <laughs> Lizette has actually uh, been straddling several roles as she moves into a project role within the USU, uh, but still has huge passion and enthusiasm for Incubate, and we're so grateful for her and her baking. Thank you. And uh, finally, James, 12 cohorts down, still passionate as ever, and uh, giving blunt but well-meaning advice to all of our startups, which uh, meant that they gave you the fantastic presentations that you saw tonight. Uh, so a big thank you to James Alexander. And finally, thank you to our startups. This has been a really exciting experience moving into our co-working space and seeing the collaboration across the cohort. We had Gabrielle teaching others how to sew. We had James Bailey helping with technical problems. It really was a truly uh, collaborative and creative entrepreneurial environment. And we have to say thank you so much to all of our startups for bringing their best every day for the last 14 weeks. So thank you very much. And finally, uh, one lucky person is perched upon a seat that has a unicorn underneath it. And, hold on, if you have it, you have won two tickets to StartCon, uh, which, is, which are valued at, I think, $300 each. So that's uh, in the end of November. And uh, if you get that, then find Lizette, our superstar, who will help you with that. Otherwise, enjoy the evening. Go talk to our startups. Thank you. If you're in the cohort, please come on stage for a quick photo. Uh, everyone else, go grab a drink. <laughs> <laughs>